Hey, you. Yeah, you. Have either of you seen a wrench? Well, I've got a hand tool for holding, twisting, and turning bolts to show you. This is a wrench. It has a profile to match the nut or bolt, the head, and finally, the shaft. Here is the typical manufacturing process of a wrench. A die cutting machine is used to cut stock lengths of steel rod to size. When the steel exit the machine, they are called billets. They next head to an induction heating machine at 1000 degrees Celsius. The heated billets are transported to a three-step forging press. First, the billet is given the rough shape of a wrench in the first die. In the second press, a more accurate die forms the final wrench shape. Finally, in the third die, the excess material is cut off. The formed wrenches leave the die press and the worker grinds off the trim line created when the two halves of the forging press clamp together. The wrenches are sent through an etch polishing machine to be cleaned and shined. A vertical milling machine drills the rough shape of a profile in one head of the wrench before being put through a hydraulic hex broaching machine where the final profile is formed. Finally, a worker grinds the edges to make the finishing touches. And this is how our wrench is manufactured. So, you guys learn a lot from that? Bet you think you're experts now, huh? Well, what if I told you there's a new revolutionary product on the market right now? It's the Wrench 2.0. By addressing the functional, geometric, and objective requirements of an ideal wrench, really smart engineers from the University of Waterloo have created the optimal tool in bolt tightening technology. Here, have a look yourself. When designing a wrench 2.0, we need to find the optimal material for the job. To do this, we need to outline some criteria that we have to meet. We separated the criteria into ergonomics, mechanics, and some additional properties that include mass, cost, and the processing properties. We start with ergonomics. The ideal tool handle shape is an ellipses with a width to height ratio of 1.25 to 1, and the length of the wrench should be triple the uh, width of the average human hand, which is roughly 100 millimeters. So if we look at the cross-sectional area of the ellipses, we can say that the uh, radial width of the ellipses is 1.25 times the radial height, and then the length of the entire wrench should be triple 100 millimeters, which is 0.3 meters. Next, we look at the mechanics of the wrench and we need to find the torque required to turn a three quarter inch bolt. We can find this first from the equation that a constant K times the clamp force, which is the force resisting the turning of the bolt, times the nominal diameter, which the nominal diameter of the three quarter inch bolt is half of an inch. The maximum clamp force that can be exerted on a three quarter inch bolt is approximately 17,400 pounds, and the constant K is found to be 0.2 in this instance. This yields us an answer of approximately 1,740 pound inches, which then we convert into Newton meters for calculations. Now we want to find the minimum force required to turn this bolt, which from a different torque equation we can rearrange and divide the found minimum torque by our constrained length, which is 0.3 meters, and this is found to be roughly 650 newtons. We want to add in a safety factor of 1.5, which then will give us that our required force that the wrench needs to withstand is 980 newtons. And now lastly, the additional properties. We want, to we want to constrain our mass to be no less or no more than 0.5 kilograms. The processing properties need to be based on our manufacturing method that we talked about before. So the material we choose needs to be able to be hot formed, press formed, 
and deep drawn. And our final step was finding out the cost. So we determined that it should be five Canadian dollars, no less. Then we calculated in the price per unit volume, which we then have to calculate the volume of our wrench. So we decided on the 1 to 1.25 ratio, uh, having our radial height at 0 0.016 meters, which then would give us a 0 0.02 meter radial width. And then our constrained length at 0.3 meters would give it, it gives us approximately 0 0.0003 cubic meters. We divide that by our five Canadian dollars per um, 0 0.0003 meters cubed, and that gives us approximately 16,600 Canadian dollars per meter cubed. From, from here, we're going to be deriving the material property index from our criteria previously discussed that's been separated into requirements, constraints, and objectives. Our requirements are that the material must be able to withstand 980 newtons of force, the mass cannot exceed 0.5 kilograms, nor can it deflect more than 5 millimeters, and the cost in materials per wrench must be less than 5 Canadian dollars. We, the wrench has been constrained to be, the length is fixed at 0.3 meters. The ratio of width and height of the cross-sectional ellipses is fixed at 1.25 to 1. And the material must be able to be hot formed, press formed, and deep drawn. And we've identified our two objectives to be minimizing mass and minimizing cost. From here, we formulated three equations. One is our objective function of mass volume times density, and then we have two requirement equations with fracture force and deflection. We've rearranged each of those equations in terms of A, which is a free variable between them and the objective function. From where we do that, we get a mass function in terms of fracture force and a mass function in terms of maximum deflection, where we've separated them into the geometric constraints, functional constraints, and material properties. From there, we're going to get an Ashby plot where we have our material properties, density over Young's modulus, where we're gonna, we put Young's modulus on the y-axis, density on the x-axis. For our mass function, we're gonna have Young's modulus on the y-axis and density on the x-axis. For the line of the limit line on the graph, we use material properties part of the equation to determine the slope of the line. We use the constraints to find a point on that line to see where it situates on the graph. Now, we decided in order to ma minimize mass, we'll maximize the inverse of the material properties portion of the equation, which, since we're maximizing this, we're going to only use materials above the line on each of them, and we cannot use any materials that are below the line. The Ashby plots narrowed down the material search to 2,342 remaining materials. We then used the remaining constraints as limits on the selection to narrow down the search to 11. From the final 11 materials, we prioritized yield strength and chose the most reasonably priced material of the three strongest or three highest yield strength materials, which resulted in uncoated press hardening steel, 22 manganese boron 5. Wow, wasn't that neat? But I bet you're suspicious of all these fancy claims we're making. Well, don't you worry. We can back all of this up with science. Here, take a look yourself. This is the heat treatment process for press hardening steel, 22 magnets more on five. There are two stages. The first is to oxidize the metal at 925 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. The second is to coin it in water to bring it to room temperature rapidly. This ensures an almost entire composition of martensite, which can attribute to the steel's high yield strength. So the next step in the finishing process would be chrome plating. What we do is we take the wrench and we dip it into that of chromic acid with another electrode. And the chromic acid acts as an electrolyte. Chromium atoms are then thinly deposited on the wrench once we apply a current through the vat. Why do we do this? 
It adds a decorative and durable surface finish, but most importantly, it adds corrosion resistance. So, you've learned a lot today, huh? Yeah. Would you consider buying the Wrench 2.0? Of course, yeah. Well, do I have a deal for you. Call now in the next five minutes to get not one, but two Wrench 2.0s for the price of one. That's a buck a wrench.